Bell Paulsen hailed from the quaint town of Christiania, nestled in Norway. Her father, Peter Paulsen, roamed as a conjurer and magician. Even in her tender years, Bell participated in his shows, captivating audiences with her graceful tightrope dances. They thrived, and their prudent ways enabled them to retire while Bell was still in her teens. Her father invested in a small farm in their homeland, securing a tranquil life for their family. Afterward, Bell journeyed to the United States, where approximately two years later, she wedded a Swede named Albert Sorensen. They resided in Chicago, and in 1900, Sorensen died under the most suspicious circumstances. While it was said that he died from heart failure, his relatives were positive that he was poisoned, and as a motive for the deed, pointed to the fact that the widow collected the life insurance of $8,500 as soon as possible after his death. An inquest was reportedly ordered, yet inexplicably, the body was never unearthed. Following this, Mrs. Sorensen relocated to Austin, Illinois, where shortly after that, her residence was engulfed in flames. A question arose as to the origin of the fire, but in the absence of proof of fraud, the insurance companies were forced to pay the insurance. She then returned to Chicago, where she conducted a confectionery store at Grand Avenue and Elizabeth Street, which was gutted by fire. The enigmatic fire prompted another inquiry by insurance officials, ultimately leading to the compelled settlement of her claim. Not long after, she acquired a farm approximately six miles from Laporte, Indiana, and entered matrimony with Peter Gunnis just a few months later. Belle Gunnis and her children. In 1904, a meat chopper is said to have fallen off a shelf and split his Peter Gunnis head open, thus ending his existence. The weeping widow described to the coroner's jury how it fell from a shelf and struck her poor husband's head, and in the absence of proof to the contrary, the statement was accepted as true. At the time of Gunnis's demise, she was survived by three young children, Philip, Myrtle, and Lucy. Additionally, she had an adopted daughter named Jenny Olson, who was 14 years old. When, um, in September 1906, the girl vanished and Mrs. Gunnis explained her absence by claiming she had sent her to Los Angeles to further her education. Subsequently, the woman hired a man named Ray Lamphere to tend to the chores around the property. In 1906, she placed an advertisement in the matrimonial sections of prominent newspapers in Chicago and other major cities, which read as follows, personal, attractive widow, owner of a spacious farm in a prime Laporte County district, seeks to meet a gentleman of comparable means, aiming to unite fortunes. Correspondence is only accepted from those willing to substantiate with a personal visit. In May 1907, Old B. Budsberg, a widower of mature years from Yola, Wisconsin, chanced upon the advertisement. Finding it appealing, he resolved to discreetly investigate without divulging a word to his adult sons, Oscar and Matthew. The elderly gentleman ventured from his abode, but never returned. His last sighting was during the negotiation of a mortgage sale at the Laporte Savings Bank, where he withdrew the funds on April 6, 1907. In December 1907, Andrew Hegelein, a prudent bachelor from Aberdeen, South Dakota, corresponded with Mrs. Gunnis. She advised him to visit the farm, suggesting he liquidate his business interests in South Dakota, as she found his letters highly impressive. Hegelein, eager with his progress, complied with her request and arrived at her farm in January 1908. After spending about two weeks there, he accompanied her to the savings bank in Laporte to present a $2,900 check. However, as he was unfamiliar to the bankers and they wouldn't accept Mrs. Gunnis's endorsement for such a sum, they left the check for collection. Shortly after, the draft cleared and he received the funds. Mrs. Gunnis then deposited $500 in that bank $700 in the state bank, and settled various substantial bills, indicating she had obtained the money from Hageline. Several days later, Hageline went missing, and Mrs. Gunnis asserted that he had withdrawn the funds intending to travel to Norway. He had a brother named A.K. Hageline in Aberdeen, South Dakota, and as the weeks rolled by and he heard nothing from his brother, he became alarmed and wrote to Mrs. Gunnis regarding him in her response, she mentioned that the only information she could provide was the missing man's assertion that he withdrew his funds, intending to journey to Norway. However, she conveyed some concern regarding his failure to disclose his plans to his brother. 
She proposed in her letter that he sell his brother's remaining stock along with his own and visit her farm, suggesting they conduct a thorough search together for his whereabouts. At 3.30 a.m. on April 28, 1908, Mrs. Gunnis's residence was engulfed in flames, reducing it to rubble. Among the debris, authorities discovered the charred bodies of a woman and three children. While the children were promptly identified as Mrs. Gunnis's offspring, uncertainty lingered regarding the identity of the woman due to the severe damage to her head. Ray Lamphere, the farmhand, departed from her service on February 3, 1908, following a dispute. Mrs. Gunnis and procured employment on a farm owned by John Wheatbrook, a short distance from the Gunnis place. After Lamb Fear left Mrs. Gunnis, he frequently intimated that he could make it interesting for her if he wanted to talk. But her only response to this was that Lamb Fear was crazy, because it was conclusively proven that he was present on the premises when the fire ignited, Sheriff Smolzer took him into custody. The mysterious remarks made by Lamb Fear regarding making trouble for Mrs. Gunnis were recalled, and a most thorough investigation was instituted with the result that five more mutilated and decomposed bodies were found buried in the backyard on May 5th. Because it was conclusively proven that he was present on the premises when the fire ignited, Sheriff Smolzer took him into custody. Bodies was recognized as that of Jenny Olson Gunnis, the 16-year-old adopted daughter of Mrs. Gunnis, who was believed to be in Los Angeles pursuing her education. It is presumed that she was murdered because she knew too much regarding the death of Peter Gunnis in 1904. The second body was identified as Andrew Hageline from South Dakota. The third was an unidentified man, while the fourth and fifth were two eight-year-old girls. On May 6th, four more bodies of men were discovered in the backyard. In many cases, the limbs had been removed from the bodies in a manner suggesting the perpetrator was familiar with anatomy. It was theorized that some of the bodies were too heavy for the woman to handle. On May 9th, two additional bundles containing bones, decomposed flesh, and clothing were unearthed in the private graveyard. However, due to the advanced state of decomposition, identification was impossible. On May 14th, a few bones from another victim were found in the cellar's ashes. These discoveries cast serious doubt on the true fate of Mrs. Gunnis. It was suspected that, in addition to murdering her children and several others, she had lured an unsuspecting woman into her home, killed her, and disfigured her remains to prevent identification. After setting fire to the house, she escaped, assuming the charred remains would be mistaken for hers and that no further search would occur. However, this theory proved incorrect. On May 16th, a lower jawbone found in the ashes was examined by Dr. Morton, a dentist in Laporte, who positively identified it as work he had done for Mrs. Gunnis a year prior. Additionally, rings found on the fingers of the deceased woman were confirmed to belong to Mrs. Gunnis. There was a difference of opinion as to how Mrs. Gunnis met her death. The theory of the prosecution was that she was burned to death, but Dr. J. Myers gave it as his opinion that death was caused by contraction of the heart, probably due to strychnine poisoning, which was the poison used in killing Hagelin and several other victims. Following the discovery of Mrs. Gunnis's private graveyard, Oscar and Matthew Budsberg arrived in Laporte. They harbored suspicions that their elderly father, who had vanished under mysterious circumstances from his residence in Eola, Wisconsin, in May 1907, might have become ensnared in this woman's scheme. Their suspicions were confirmed when they identified one of the bodies as their missing father. Olaf Linbo of Chicago reported that his brother Thomas had been employed by Mrs. Gunnis three years prior. The latest correspondence he received from Thomas revealed his intention to wed his employer. After Olaf received no further word from his brother, he reached out to Mrs. Gunnis. Her response claimed that Thomas had departed for St. Louis. However, Olaf never received any communication from Thomas thereafter. On May 12th, the surgical instruments with which the bodies were probably dismembered were found in the ashes. On May 19th, Miss Jenny Graham of Waukesha, Wisconsin, arrived in Laporte to inquire regarding her brother, who had left home to marry a rich widow in Laporte, but who was never heard from after that. As most of the bodies were badly mutilated and decomposed, it was impossible to ascertain if her brother's remains were among them. Henry Gerholt from Scandinavia, Wisconsin, exchanged letters with Mrs. Gunnis before traveling to Laporte with $1,500 in hand. 
he vanished without a trace. However, a watch discovered among the remains closely resembled the one he wore. Stay tuned for part two of Hell's Bells. See us soon from all of us at Midnight Society.